Welcome back for another episode of the Ozark Podcast. You've got Kyle Veet on the mic as always, and I am out here today at Crooked Creek, and that's because I'm joined by a special guest uh, for the episode, Mr. Tad Four. And Tad is a fly fishing guide, um, specifically focused, you know, you love smallmouth fishing. And so we wanted to bring you on today to, to talk about smallmouth and uh, to hear your story and also kind of give some tactics for anyone listening who wants to go catch smallmouth, wants to get outside and, and enjoy um, something that is special to people here in the Ozark. So, Tad, welcome to the podcast. Man, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we couldn't have picked a better venue. Dude, this is awesome. Yeah. For yeah. anyone looking, if, if you're looking at the video on, on our Instagram or on YouTube, Crooked Creek is, is right behind us, and it's just, it's pristine. I mean, we, it's low, right? Like, we haven't got a lot of rain lately, so it's low, but it is crystal clear. Yeah, it's low, but uh, secretly, I kind of like it that way. Yeah, so, yeah. So it makes for some good fishing if you know what you're doing. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Uh, let's just start um, with, you know, who you are, what you do. Obviously, you're a fly fishing guide, but where are you from? How did you get into fly fishing, and, and how did that kind of develop into a career? Yeah, so I'm originally from a little town um, of Black Rock, it, population 600, something okay. like that. Uh, so small, my high school doesn't even exist anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, it is, it is no longer it's there. It's gone. Oh, man. There's still a building, but no people. Dang. Uh, yeah, it shut down a few years after I had graduated. Um, so it's no longer there. Small town. Considered the foothills of the Ozarks. I mean, you cross the Black River, and you're in the, the flatlands. So okay. I guess if you had to twist my arm, I would be a flatlander. Gotcha. <laughs> um, but... Uh, my, I grew up cane pulling for crappie, basically, okay. um, chasing panfish, crappie, things like that, um, doing a little lake fishing here and there, um, or bass pond fishing with rooster tails, things like that. But that was the, really the extent of my fishing knowledge. I was much more into hunting and things like that growing okay. up. Uh, big duck hunter growing yeah. up, for okay. sure. Okay, gotcha. Um, but it wasn't until college, actually, I met my now wife, uh, Mackenzie, and um, it was in college that I, through my wife, met Dwayne Hayda, who you've had on right, yeah. Um, recently. Yeah, he was on there. Gosh, that it's been a while. It was, it was a, well, not a long time, but maybe 14 episodes or so ago. It seems like that was not that long ago. But yeah, yeah, Dwayne, he, he, yeah. he came on here. Yeah, so that is my now father-in-law. So I come by it honestly. Um, actually, it was he and, and my wife who basically taught me everything I knew, no, other than just being out here on my own. Yeah. Um, but he taught me to fly fish. So, um, I, I hit it from the ground running, um, and took off with it, fell in love with it so much so that I made it my career. And here we are today. Um, but the first fish I ever caught on the fly, um, on my own independently was a smallmouth. Okay. Um, out of this creek. Out of Crooked? Out of Crooked Creek. Um, so it's definitely... Near and dear to my heart um, in that respect, um, but have loved every second I have spent on this creek. Uh, it's not always the easiest to fish, and it's not always doesn't love me back sometimes. Yeah, but uh, I will always love it for sure. Yeah, and so you kind of how how did you start actually um, guiding and like getting into teaching other people how to fish? Yeah, so um, once I felt like I was at that point, I had spent. You know, as I've always been told it's not the years, it's the miles. Um, spent a lot of long miles on the water. Yeah. Um, I actually, after college, moved out west to western Colorado. Okay. And trout guided. I, I, was, a, I was a trout guide for Montrose Anglers in Montrose, Colorado. And uh, loved that. It was great. I love trout fishing. Don't get me wrong. This isn't me spending an hour knocking trout fishing by no means. Yeah. They're they're fantastic. And I loved every second of that, but I was missing home. I was missing my smallmouth. So decided if I were to move back to Arkansas, back to the Ozarks, that's what I would do is start guiding smallmouth as much as possible. So um, we ended up, we did move back, obviously, and uh, started from there. Um, started off guiding from a canoe, which limits you to one client, or guiding on foot, which limits you to young people. Yeah. Um, so client base wasn't huge at the time, um, but I decided if I was going to do this thing, I was going to do it for real. So made the investment, 
uh, bought a, a three-man framed raft, um, a Smith fly. Okay. And it's, it's completely changed the game for me over the past few years. I can now take two clients. We can now float um, ages of any kind. And it's opened up some new waters for me, or at least for my clients. Right. So uh, it's been good. It's been good. It's been a good time. It's caught a lot of big fish over the years and going to keep catching big yeah. fish. Yeah, yeah. And so you've, you've. it sounds like you started kind of on your own. You actually spent some time working with Steve Daly, yep. right, over mm-hmm. there. And then now you're still kind of doing your own guiding thing again, right? Yeah, so when we first moved back to Arkansas, we were looking for a gig, Um we were look. I had actually applied to several places throughout the U.S. I was offered a job at Sims, actually. Okay. Um, but it was going to pay the same I was making in Colorado. So f- I had heard of an opening uh, for assistant manager at Dally's. So I called Dally's, um, called Steve, and asked him about the position. We did a little short phone interview. Uh, my wife, her summer job was actually working at Dally's. Okay. During college. Gotcha. So she worked at Dally's and. He'll tell he'll tell you to this day, Steve will that the only reason he hired me was to get Mackenzie back. Yeah. So, um, so we moved back. I was assistant manager there for almost three years, I think. Okay, something like that. And then back in January, left there, um, still guiding for them, smallmouth, and on my own. But now I manage um, White Buffalo Resort down at Buffalo City, where the Buffalo River comes into the White River. Right. So right. that's uh, taking up a lot of my time. Yeah. In a good way. Yeah. Um, but still, definitely guiding as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So you got a you've got a um, very fishy family. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like. I mean, between mm-hmm. Dwayne and Mackenzie, sounds like she fishes a lot too. Mm-hmm. Does everyone in the family fly fish? So the haters do. Okay. Dwayne and Mackenzie and Marlene, Mackenzie's mother, they're very fishy. They've fished all over the world, um, and Mackenzie. I mean, she's even done saltwater stuff. Um, before I w- had a chance to, I did my first saltwater last year, uh, which was awesome. Um, but yeah, they're all fishy. My side of the family, uh, you know, bass ponds, they're still over in the flatlands. Yeah. So, yep. Still cane pulling. Yeah. For still crappie still cane pulling for the crappie. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Well, um, it's, it's been cool to, after I got to talk with Dwayne, just, just hear how passionate he is about fly fishing and, and kind of hear his story as well. But, uh, for you, what what about smallmouth fishing? It it sounds like you know you you said you enjoy trout fishing as well, but but a lot of times you do kind of gravitate towards smallmouth. What about smallmouth fishing? Like why why do you think it's it's so special to you? Why do you feel like you kind of gravitate towards that? Well, you know, I think a, a big part of it is it was how I first learned to fly fish. Yeah, was for smallmouth bass in this creek. Um, that probably has a lot to do with the, the nostalgia factor sure. of it. Um, I'll, but, you know, I've spent so many years cracking the code of Ozark smallmouth, and it is a code, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but I've spent so many years trying to crack that cr- code, and when you experience victory of a Ozark smallmouth, it's it's something special, man. They they are, as we, we've touched on um, in our conversations, they are the native you know, symbol of the Ozarks. They they need to be the poster child of the Ozarks. The brown trout will always be, but he wasn't here first. Right. Yeah. You know, he doesn't. He's not from here. Yeah. He's yeah. not from around here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can go in a multitude of different streams. You can blue line for these smallmouth throughout the Ozarks, um, and it's uh, they're just very special. And you know, they grow so extremely slow. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, Crooked Creek has the fastest growth rate in the state. Really, and it's still very, very slow. I didn't know that. Yeah. What is so? Yeah. Is there some kind of like measurement or metric that they that they track that? It, so this data is probably old. Yeah. It's probably you know in the eighties or something like that. Um, but there's like a so basically, if you're looking at about a fifteen inch fish, there's a good chance out of Crooked Creek, he's probably you know six, seven, eight years old. An 18-inch fish may be pushing 12 years old, something mm. like that. Yeah. And that's just slightly faster than a lot of your other Ozark streams, Washita streams. Um, I know I've caught fish out of the Cossatot River yeah. um, that were gravid. They were full of eggs, and they were only six inches long. Imagine oh, wow. how slow of a growth rate, growth rate that is. If you're six inches long and yet you're sexually mature, you know, very slow. Um, I think actually Costa Todd has the slowest growth rate okay. in, in Arkansas for smallmouth. Um, 
But uh, yeah, Crooked Creek has one of the fastest growth rates. Uh, yeah, extremely slow. I mean, they they have a lot going against them. Uh, the old Indian name for the smallmouth is Ashigan, and it means one who struggles. Oh. Um, I think that alludes more to its fight um, when you are catching it. Yeah. But it also struggles to survive. Mm. I mean, their fry are um, dark black or dark brown, so they're very visible to predators. Right. Um, no other species has such a visible fry. They also spawn during rainy season, so a lot of their spawn gets blown out and destroyed. You know, they have a lot going against them. And then when you add in the human factor... Um, where we are in the area where catch and release is definitely not the prevalent mindset. Yeah. Um, they have a lot going against them. So they're a very special fish, especially when you catch a larger one. You know, honor it, um, revere it, um, enjoy it, yeah. and send it home. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Want to keep those guys in the, yeah. in the creek as, as best we can. Yeah. And I know that the, uh, the, the limits are, they've, they've become more strict or the regulations have increased because I think people have started to realize and Game and Fish realizes the resource that we have in smallmouth. But what what are the current limits right now in smallmouth? So out of Crooked Creek, well, throughout the state, it's two over 12 inches. Okay. But there, the Ozarks region is um, two over 14. Um, and like Crooked Creek here, it's two over 14, but there are sections that's one over 18. Like the lower Buffalo, the last 24 miles, yeah. it's one over 18. Um, there's a stretch here on Crooked Creek that's one over 18, but it's, it's not, um, publicized well. Um, it's, it's kind of the reading in the, in the regs book is kind of confusing. I could go on and on yeah. with, with the problems I have, but, um, let me just go on a tangent here. Yeah. Go ahead, man. <laughs> We're all about the tangent. Yeah. A little rant. Um, you know, they do, Game of Fish does a great job. Okay. They do a great job. And they've done a great job with Crooked Creek. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of big fish I've seen in the past few years has been incredible. It's great. They're super hard to catch, which is another great thing. That means hopefully they'll continue to thrive. Yeah, it's surviving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, But they have been doing surveys at the public accesses over the past couple years, catch and release surveys, asking, hey, have you caught any fish today? Have you kept any? What have you kept? Um... And they have found, I forget the figure, I think it was like upper 90% of people are catch and release on smallmouth. But here's my one concern with those figures. Um, If an authority figure comes and asks you if you've been keeping fish, what are you going to say? Yeah, no. You know? (laughs) You're going to say no. Um, Also, what I have witnessed with my time on the creek is it's not the people coming and using the accesses that are keeping fish. It's the landowners. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, This is not a knock on, this is, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but um, there are people from certain states, is their, it is their, their upbringing. It's just, you eat what you can. It's like the tradition of eating what you catch. That's how they were raised. And, a lot of people from those states have actually bought property along Crooked Creek, and I have witnessed holes that were honey holes become barren. Okay. So, in the places that those people from those states have, <laughs> have bought property. Yeah. So, from- <laughs> so, just from my time and experience on the creek, I've seen it struggle. Um, but with that being said, there are still big fish, and I, I tend to see more every year yeah so, yeah that's good that's good mm-hmm. and it's to uh, you mentioned it but just to emphasize when you catch a big smallmouth it's an old fish yeah. and, and that's why it's so important for you for other people who enjoy smallmouth to if you see a big one and you catch a big one make sure you put it back because yeah. it takes a long long time to replace yeah and ozark smallmouth they're different they're they're a different strain okay than your northern smallmouth um, which is literally the northern strain. Yeah. Like up in your Great Lakes, um, Wisconsin, things like that. That's a different strain of smallmouth. They get much bigger. They have faster growth rates, uh, cooler temperatures. Um, you know, you can, the smallmouth up there, their genetics, they actually grow big, wide shoulders. Mm. They get tall and long. You know, you're catching 22 inch smallmouth or 22 inches wide. Um, down like here, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But down here, they're, they're much more torpedo shaped. Um, they're designed to hide out and ambush because they've got a lot of things going against them. Um, 
We do have northern strain in Crooked Creek, but they were introduced years and years ago. Okay. And it's not the same northern strain. Um, it's actually like northern Missouri strain. Um, and they still have that golden olive color, and they're not the big dark brown ones that you right. see up north. Um, and then up towards your way in northwest Arkansas, we have the Neoshos. Right. Which I would consider like the symbol of the Ozarks, the Neosho smallmouth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, was here since the dawn of time, um, wasn't introduced like the northern was. Um, we probably have had Neoshos here or did have, but they've hybridized with the northern. Okay. Um, but the Neosho, what really stands out about it, it has a very extreme uh, underbite, which is one way you can really tell in the Neosho. They're super yellow color, and then they have this really extreme underbite, and then they have those really white pectoral fins, which is really cool. Interesting. But, mm-hmm. So most of the, the smallmouth that you see in Crooked are somewhat of a hybrid, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, a lot of them are going to be hybridized with like a northern Missouri strain. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to catch a, a pure Neosho, a pure Neosho out of Crooked Creek. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Over, over by my place um, in like western... Northwest Arkansas on the west side of I-49. When we go in those little farm creeks back there and, and little, you, you know, behind the cow pastures where the little creeks running through, a lot of times it's their Neoshos that we're pulling out. And they're super blonde, like yeah. that yellow color. Mm-hmm. They don't have a whole lot of the striping, yeah. I, I notice a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but incredible fish to catch, super fun. And it's amazing. Like, you drive over a creek and you think it's a little nothing creek. You go down in there and you can pull out. I pulled out uh, some really, really quality fish out of these little holes that no one would ever think that you could go fish and catch a big smallmouth in yeah. there. Yeah, they're really cool. They're special, man. They're special. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's get into um, how do you catch these suckers? I mean, you know, that's what everyone wants to know. Is is they're an awesome fish. Everyone I think can get behind that. They appreciate it, but they can, as you mentioned, it can be a challenge and to catch one, especially a good sized one. Um, so let's, let's just start with, um, for someone who's getting into it, what are some of the basic things that they need to, to get out and, and go, let's say fly fishing for smallmouth? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, two things you really got to know is your river way. Um, basically what I mean by that is you've got to know how your river flows. Um, you need to know the depth of your river, the width of your river, um, its structure. You need to know that. So what I mean by that, as far as Crooked Creek goes, if you were to look at a cross-section of Crooked Creek, about two-thirds of it would be gravel bar, which by this time of year would be dry. Yeah. And then a third of it is a fishable channel. Okay. So that eliminates a lot of flies you can actually use. So you're not throwing game changers. You're not throwing articulated streamers. You don't have the width to actually retrieve one back to you. Gotcha. So that eliminates something like that. Whereas, let's say, the Illinois River over in... Uh, Eastern Oklahoma. Um, It's a wider river. Um, It does, you know, obviously drops out when there's no rain, but it's a wider river. Um, And they actually have huge smallmouth over there, huge smallmouth. Really? Um, They were actually lake strain, um, Tennessee strain smallmouth that were put in the lake that moved up into the upper river. Oh, cool. They're huge. I mean, five, six pounds. Yeah, I, uh, I've i seen some pictures. I actually haven't got to go fish the Illinois that far over. I've, I've It kind of cuts into Arkansas a little bit, yeah. and I fished that. But I don't think I haven't seen the size that I've seen in some of the like right there. Uh, uh, is it ten killer? Yeah, that comes up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that brings me to my next point. So you got to know your river. Okay. The next point is you got to know the food source. So back to the Illinois River. The reason why the smallmouth went up into the river is because they were following their shad that were coming out of the lake. Okay. So the predominant food source is larger bait fish in the Illinois. Um, you're not going to be fishing crawfish near as much over there as you are on Crooked Creek. Gotcha. Um, you're fishing larger bait fish. The springtime over there, big clousers or big uh, circus peanuts, or they even use double deceivers over there. Okay, yeah. Um, works great for those big smallmouth over there. You cannot get away with that over here. Um, number one, you don't have the width. Sure. In the, in the early spring, when we've got bigger water, big dingy water, I do throw articulated, and we do catch big fish. But that's the only time of year that we have the width on this creek to actually do that. Um, Most of the time of the year, their dominant food source is going to be the dusky striped shiner minnow. Okay. Which has got a dark back, a black lateral line, 
and a white belly yep. or crawfish. And specifically the ringed crawfish, these little olive color, uh, olive to tan with red rings. Okay, yeah. Um, and orange tipped pinchers. Gotcha. Um, so that's the two dominant food sources here on this creek. And right now, almost all we're using are crawfish. Really? So, and there's a very specific way to fish the crawfish. So let's jump into that. Yeah. Um, this takes a lot of practice. Okay. Um, a lot of practice because typically when you're fly fishing, you your fly rod's got a taper, your fly line has a taper, your leader has a taper. It allows you to cast a lot easier. Okay. Yeah. But when you're fishing a crawfish, um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to cast. Yeah, Number one, it's super heavy. They're heavy. Super heavy. Number two, to get it to the bottom, which is where a crawfish lives, it has to stay on the bottom. So a tapered leader won't allow you to get to the bottom and stay there. Okay. Because of that thickness. Mm -hmm. It won't let you get down. So what well, we usually fish um, from the fly line, we have a, about a two-foot section of about 20-pound test or so. Okay. And then the rest, I'm talking nine, ten feet. Is straight two X tippet. Really? Mm -hmm. Fluoro? Uh, you don't have to use fluoro. You don't have you to. You could, um, if you want to spend the money on it. Yeah, but that stuff's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Okay. Uh, maybe in the dead of August, um, in highly pressured stretches of this creek, maybe fluorocarbon, but uh, more times than than not, you don't have to. Gotcha. So two so two feet of twenty pound test, just mm -hmm. regular off the shelf mono. Yep. And then you stretch that out depending on the section, or are you pretty much always going like that nine, eight or nine feet of, uh, did you say 4X? No, 2X. 2X, okay. 2X, yeah. That's about eight pound test or so. Okay. Um, depends on the stretch. Yeah. But I really want to be on the bottom, stay on the bottom, and not spook any fish. Gotcha. I need, even if my tippet gets caught in the current, I don't need it to pull my crawfish away from a smallmouth who's mm -hmm. chasing it. So. Yeah. Um, having that thinner tippet allows it to kind of stay put a little longer. Um, but with that, that's where the practice comes in because you've got to cast that thing. And you're not casting it. You're not looking like a river runs through it. You're yeah. you're lobbing that thing and hoping it doesn't hit you in the back of the yeah. head like a 22 short or The old chuck and duck. Yeah, the old chuck and duck. Method. Smallmouth style. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, you take a lot of clients out and you guys spend a lot of time, obviously, with – you get to spend a lot of time with – probably people who have never fished before probably you probably get some more seasoned people but when you're taking someone out who's new or maybe someone who's been fishing before what are some of like the common mistakes or common misconceptions you see people making who are kind of learning and getting into it yes yeah, so what i've noticed so predominantly we streamer fish for smallmouth and most people who are trying to learn smallmouth are trout fishermen who have not experienced streamer fishing so it's that's a new game for them. Right. Learning to work with the current, how to retrieve. Um, but the one thing I've noticed the most when we're fishing from the boat, um, I usually can guide from the boat through the month of June okay. and it drops out too low. Yeah. Um, I can I can float Mark Oliver access to Kelly's access, but so can everybody else. Yeah. So my trips right now are on foot. <laughs> yeah. You get pretty, a lot of pressure when you, yeah. When, when you're, there's one stretch, you can only float one stretch, then everybody's going to float that yeah. stretch. So I stay off of it. But um, when we're fishing, streamer fishing from a boat, um, too many people fall into the trap of getting in a rhythm with a retrieve. Basically strip, strip, pause, strip, strip, pause. It's like a robot. You know, they just, there's no, uh, erratic movement to it. There's mm -hmm. no life to their fly. Yeah. Um, so especially later in the day when they're tired. Right. Yeah. Uh, they had a long day exactly. in the sun. Yeah, exactly. People tend to just let their fly just kind of do this in the water back to the boat all lazily, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, if you can stay disciplined and be erratic with your movements, um, long pauses, short pauses, long strips, short strips, maybe three strips here, two strips there, be erratic with it, um, your success goes way up uh, because you are a fleeing or wounded minnow. Yeah. And you got to act like one. Yeah. So um, that's what the smallmouth is going to want to eat. Okay. So you got to be erratic. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, you're talking, you said minnow there, so you're talking early spring a lot of times because you mentioned you're in the boat. Yeah, in the boat. So through June. Through June. Usually I'm in the boat. Okay. Um, but my flies do change as the season progresses. So spring, I'm talking late March through... Mid May, we can get away with the articulated stuff. Big white stuff is what I like. So yeah. there, there are food source changes too. So in the spring, 
it's the central stone roller minnow that okay. they eat. It's bigger, meatier. Um, they kind of hunker at the bottom, so they're easier prey. And as the smallmouth try to get their metabolism built up, they need a little bit easier prey. Right. So the central stone roller is a great springtime um, imitation. Just a big, giant, bulky clouser um, made out of craft fur. Mm-hmm is probably the best imitation, especially if you're not comfortable with articulated flies. But I've also been known to use a white circus peanut. Um, I've thrown, actually Steve's uh, Tiny Dancer Mm -hmm. with some success, more so on the buffalo, um, but with some success when this river is a little bit wider and deeper in the spring. And uh, then as the season progresses, we get into late May, June, that's when I, transition to dusky striped shiners yeah so still craft for a clouser but my minnow downsizes and it's got that brown back black lateral line and white belly okay and then as the season continues to progress so july august and on a day they want a minnow my minnow is even smaller and less material Mm. but still that dusky striped shiner gotcha so you just go more sparse with the material exactly you downsize the hook what what size hook do you are you putting on on a day like that? Typically number so I don't I don't normally downsize the hook. Okay, I do just make more sparse the material. Gotcha. So size two. Okay. Uh, Thirty three sixty six from Mustad is a good one. Um, the U five hundred two is my favorite yeah. from Umqua. That's my favorite smallmouth hook for clousers. Okay, gotcha, so, gotcha. Mm-hmm. So that's okay. So then as you get into a little bit later in the summer, like right now, it's we're we're pro, we're midway through uh, July. We're mm-hmm. coming up on August. How does it change as you get into this? You mentioned a lot more crawdads. Are you and you said you kind of exclusively flip to crawdads? Yeah. So the water drops out. Yeah. The fish become more congregated, which means they're also more alert um, to their surroundings because okay. they feel. They've told me. They've told me this. They, yeah. they feel claustrophobic. You have a close relationship yeah. <laughs> with the fish. They're like, Dad, we're not feeling that fly yeah. today. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They, they, and they also become more opportunistic. So, um, if they see a crawfish, they want to eat that crawfish because the next meal may be long ways away. So, um, when the water drops out, though they get more opportunistic, they also get smarter. Mm-hmm. So they can also be pickier. So having a crawfish imitation that has the right size, color, profile is key. Um, and this is a shameless plug here for Dwayne, but there is no better fly. I promise you. Some people are like, we can never catch a fish on this fly. Mm-hmm. Then they hate a creek crawler. Yeah. There is no better fly. Yeah. Um, there's been thousands of imitations, and none of them are like the hate a creek crawler. Yeah. Um, now, the Umqua version of it, so he has, he has it commercial through Umqua. It's not that great. Yeah. Um, it's it's pretty poorly done. But Keith Reeves, who you guys have interviewed in the past, um, he ties the Hayda Creek Crawler commercially yeah. um, on his own, and it is phenomenal. It's an outstanding fly. And, and just for our listeners, we actually interviewed Keith. We haven't released the episode because we actually we lost it. We recorded <laughs> it all, and then our SD card got corrupted, and so... We haven't gotten back with Keith yet, but you're 100% right. I mean, I look at that thing, and I, I think it's alive. Like, it, it's almost so beautiful that I'm like, that should be, like, a necklace or something. Like, that, that's not, you don't fish with that. An anklet. It should yeah, be an anklet. an anklet. A beautiful crawfish <laughs> anklet. Yeah, uh, there is no better fly, especially for um, low, clear water smallmouth. There's nothing better. It's it's heavy. It, it serves a purpose. It's super heavy, so it's going to stay on the bottom. The profile, the color... Is, is all what it needs to be. And you could put, you can cast a, a pine squirrel crawfish out there and set the creek crawler next to it, and they're going to eat the creek crawler nine out of ten wow. times. Now, in a pinch, that being said, if you don't have any or if you've lost all your $10 creek crawlers yeah, um, or don't want to buy any more $10 creek yeah, crawlers sure. or tie any $10 creek crawlers, um, a pine squirrel crawfish is a great substitute. Right. Um, but it's it's hard to beat the creek crawler. Yeah, um, and I'm I know he's my father in law. I'm it's nepotism, sure. but um, at its finest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm just give, telling the people what they need to hear. It, yeah, it's I'm helping you. I want to help you. Yeah, and that's how I can help you is to tell you this time of year when the going gets tough, hate a creek crawler, long tippet section, and be patient with it. Mm. Um, 
there's a technique with it. Yeah. That requires some practice and some skill. Yeah. Um, not just the casting, but also the retrieve. I was about to say, so, once you get past the cast, yeah. once you've launched the mm -hmm. creek crawler past your head yeah. and it's in the water, what does it look like from there? What is the what is the technique? Yeah, so at the risk of sounding like Mr. Miyagi, you have to become one with the fly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got to become one with the fly. You have to actually envision what the fly is doing on the bottom mm -hmm. if you can't see it. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, whether it's sun glare or um, if it's... Uh, like a windy day. A windy falls. day or in the shade or something, you can't see the fly. You have to envision, you can actually feel the fly. You can feel it scratching bottom and crawling on your fingertip when the fly line is on your fingertip. So you can actually feel it go up a boulder and fall off a mm. boulder. And you can feel it just before it catches onto a boulder. You can release it and get it free and just crawl in and around the boulders. And, again, it just takes being out there and yeah. doing it. Most of my clients cannot do it until the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, but it is deadly when you master it, it is a deadly way to catch smallmouth this time of year. I wish I could say I could throw double deceivers all year long for smallmouth. Yeah. Or I wish I could just drift boogle bugs all year long. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Crooked Creek doesn't allow that. Mm. So we had to adapt and overcome. And this technique is hard to do, but it is effective. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it sounds, it sounds effective. And, and I think too, it's, it's definitely a completely different strategy of like if you come from a trout fishing background and, and you try to switch over and you start getting into the smallmouth game a little bit more, you really have to change a lot of kind of what you learn, your retrieve tactics. You're not pulling in those big strips. You got to think about like what a crawdad might do. Are you still being just as erratic as you might with like a an imitation of a dying minnow or are you really kind of slowing everything down and and just crawling or how, do, how does that look? Yeah, that's a great question. So you do move in slow motion. Yeah. You slow it way down. You oftentimes just let it sit mm -hmm. if you have to. If the current allows that, you can let it sit. And that usually that that's in a case where you're able to sight fish. So when you're able to actually see a smallmouth, say, I'm going to fish to that smallmouth, see your fly, and you can play cat and mouse with that smallmouth. You can let that thing sit there. And oftentimes that's the most effective way to do it. Just but leaving it alone. Just leaving it alone. Really? When it comes to, like, investigate, give it a slow twitch. Yeah. I mean, just, like, move it a quarter of an inch. Um, and that oftentimes is, a, is all it takes. He'll, yeah. He'll come up on it just four inches away from it, and then you'll do a slow twitch, and then he'll freak out, and he'll, and he'll gulp it right down. Take so, it. Um, awesome. oftentimes that's, that's all it takes. But in the situations where maybe you're fishing a deeper, faster run, and you can't sight fish... Letting that thing just tumble, just tumble on the bottom. Now, if it's, it's if it's not off the bot on the bottom, it's not going to work. It is a useless fly if mm. it's not on the bottom. You got to be all the way down. Mm -hmm. okay. It's got to be on the bottom. I don't think I've ever caught a smallmouth on a crawfish pattern off the bottom of the creek. Yeah. So it's got to be on the bottom. But if it's tumbling like a crawfish caught in the current, um, it's another great way to to work it. Now, to do that. We do, me and Dwayne like to describe it as check nymphing at a distance. Okay. So, um, out west, Euro nymphing, while I was out there guiding, Euro nymphing became all the rage. Mm -hmm. So, I had to learn how to do that so I could guide people on that. Yeah. Um, but essentially, you're tight lining right in front of you, you know, right below your, your fly rod. Um, but with the creek crawler, you're doing the same thing, but at a distance. So, what you're doing is you're, you're casting... Um, what I actually like to do is cast beyond where I want to fish and basically lift my rod, drag, and drop. Mm. And it, that sends that crawfish straight to the bottom. And then I'll come tight to it. And basically, it's on the bottom now. I have, I'm have i in contact with the fly, and I can feel it tumbling, and I'm kind of just holding the fly rod up parallel with the, with the water, nice and high, and I can just feel it tumbling along the bottom, and then you'll feel a tap, 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 and then set the hook. Yeah. Get a small mouth on. So, nice. Nice. Yeah. How did the the, uh, the check style nymphing um, just on a, on a tangent? How how was that? Did you, did you enjoy doing that? Because I I haven't seen m many people doing that here. Like I, I don't feel like that's. And you tell me if I'm wrong. Do, is that a popular style here? It is not because we don't have the water for it. It's just we, a different we, water. We have high water all the time on on the White and the Norfolk. Now when the Norfolk drops out, it is like made for it. Um, but I will say, Euro nymphing. 
catches a lot of fish. Yeah. But rarely catches any quality fish. Okay, gotcha. You got to be close. And most quality fish are too smart for you to get close to them. Right. So it catches, it's like a vacuum cleaner. I mean, you just go through and you're just catching fish after fish after fish. Um, because it, your flies are heavy, they get to the bottom where the fish are. You're coming right at their face all the time. And you catch a lot of fish. But I rarely ever see quality fish yeah. being fish. caught that way. Yeah, that makes sense. When it comes to big fish on, say, Crooked Creek or big smallmouth, are they, you mentioned they get smarter in the summer. Are they a pretty spooky fish in general? Like, are you mostly trying to stalk and sneak up on them? Or can you be a little bit more clunky and, and as long as you're within casting distance, cast to them? Yep. So, in general, I would say they are a wary fish. Yeah. But I have been on rivers where I was amazed at how naive they were mm-hmm. on Crooked Creek. They get an um, insane amount of pressure all season long. Um, now, I will say the pressure definitely drops as the summer progresses, but so does the water. So, sure, yeah. so they get more wary because the water is dropping out, and it's super clear, high sun. Um, they've got to survive. So they're looking to survive, and so they're on alert at all times. Um, but in the, in the springtime, they get so much canoe and kayak traffic. I don't – I truly don't believe – they get fished to a lot, at least not fished to a lot intelligently yeah. enough. Um, but they get a lot of traffic over their heads all day long. A lot of canoes and kayaks, um, especially the past two or three years with the amount of people who are outdoors now. Right, so, yeah. Um, the bigger fish are there and you find them, um, but they're hard to get to the boat. Yeah, yeah. So after this, we're about to we're about to go hit Crooked Creek and fish a little bit and and put some of these tactics that you're that you're uh, generously sharing to use. You mentioned as we were kind of walking up here, you'll have in some of these spots you've got one shot, right? So there's a fish that's in there, and it's and is it is it just that it's so clear and they are so wary that that when we go down there, you're gonna have one shot as not to spook them. So here comes the downside of the creek crawler. It's heavy. Mm-hmm. It splashes. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes an entrance. So if you don't lead that smallmouth well, uh, if you don't lead that smallmouth way ahead of the direction it's going, you're going to spook it mm-hmm. gotcha. um, just by your splash. Okay. Um, they This time of year, it's hard to get smallmouth to come up to top water, so they're not going to see a splash and come after it. They're going to see a splash and go away mm. and go hide out. Now, I like to work my way upstream – that way I'm not spooking fish ahead because uh, right. they face upstream. So right. um, I'll usually, in the tail outs of a pool, this time of year we'll catch a lot of smaller fish, you know, 12-inch fish or so, 8 to 12-inch uh, smallmouth in the tail outs. And as we work our way up to a pool is where we'll find the larger fish. Um, but like I said, you've got one good solid shot at a, at a smallmouth. Now, with that being said, if you hook into one, he'll probably have six buddies chasing them. Yeah. So you've got more shots at those. Like if you've got a buddy with you, he can throw in there at that smallmouth and probably hook a second one and double up. That's a great technique to double up. They kind of frenzy. Yeah. Like when you hook one, they mm-hmm. all kind of freak out like, what are you eating, right? Yeah, exactly. Because oftentimes a smallmouth will start puking up what it's eaten and that's a free meal for another smallmouth. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. It's also a good way to find out what they've been eating. Yeah, so that's true. Mm-hmm. Do you, um, I guess because you, you practice catch and release so much, you're not getting the opportunity, like with trout, you can go out there and see what they've been eating, cut them open, look into them. But with smallmouth, you're exclusively catch and release, right? That is correct. I would never, ever, ever <laughs> keep a smallmouth. I don't think I would survive the day. Yeah. Just my guilty conscience would probably kill me. So, yeah. Yeah, would never keep a smallmouth. Um, but, like I mentioned, they do cough up what they've what they've been eating, um, and they only have like three or four things they actually eat. There's only so much. Yeah, so it wouldn't take you long to figure out what they're eating, more than likely. Uh, crawfish, I don't know if I want to say this one, but Mad Tom, um, Helgramite, and Minnow. What is, what's Mad Tom? So Mad Tom is the mother of all smallmouth food. It is their favorite smallmouth, or it's their, fa- it's their favorite food. Yeah. Um, you could fish out a hole. You can catch every smallmouth in that hole and go find a mad tom and throw it in that hole, and 20 smallmouth would head, headbutt each other trying to eat really? that, that mad tom. What? what and it, we've tried to imitate it. So what it is, 
there's two species here in Crooked Creek, the checkered mad tom and the slender mad tom. Um, they are, they look like a tiny little catfish. I'm not sure if they're in the catfish family or the minnow family, but they have little whiskers. They're long and slender. They live under rocks. They're awesome little creatures. Yeah. Um, but it's the slender mad tom specifically that they cannot get enough of. And I don't know, I think it's got to be an odor on that mad tom mm, because okay. it's an easy creature to imitate with a fly. Yeah, it doesn't work near as well as a real mad tom. Gotcha. Um, Cause you, uh, and I hope you don't have any bait fishers that listen to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> there goes all my small mouth. Hopefully. <laughs> you never know. I can't promise. But uh, <laughs> with, so you're saying you've tried to actually imitate those. Like you've, you've, I'm sure someone, or maybe not you, someone has tried to imitate the mad tom. Yeah. We, it's just not quite as effective. We do have mad tom and imitations that we use. Okay. Um, no one knows what a mad tom is, so there's no commercial mad tom pattern. You yeah. could, you wouldn't ever sell one, right? No one would know what it was. You're like, what the heck is? Yeah, that? Um, but you know, a close imitation is a sculpin. I mean, yeah. they're very similar to a sculpin. Yeah. Um, but basically, a lead-eyed rabbit strip in the same color as the mad tom is a great imitation, and it works. But not like a real mad tom. I mean, they will refuse everything else to eat a real mad tom. Really? Yeah, it's insane. They will come out of hiding that they've been hiding all day in the high sun at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to eat a mad tom. Wow. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. And whoever comes up with an imitation that is as good as the real thing yeah, um, or as close to you, the real thing as you can get is going to be living large on yeah, this creek. They're going to sure. make, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I've never heard of those. I'll uh, Maybe we can find some down here. And, I bet we can. And turn, turn some rocks over. Yeah, I bet we can. What about, um, we've talked through kind of some of the, the food sources and things like that, but in terms of, let's say you're not fishing Crooked Creek, or, or maybe you are and it's your first time here, what are you looking for in the water? Where, where are you going? I know you mentioned structure, but if you're going to a new creek and you kind of don't know, like, hey, is this creek going to be good for smallmouth? What should you look for? Yeah, so what, what's kind of unique and specific to Ozark smallmouth streams is a bouldery channel okay. of water. So our smallmouth love uh, a rocky substrate, so basically gravel bottom, and they love big bouldery pockets. So if you can find a creek that's got that, you've got it made. Um, creek, creek is just lined with that sort of thing. It's great smallmouth structure throughout this entire creek. Um, but deep pools that are highly oxygenated, um, smallmouth, Though they fall into the warm water category, they're more of a cool water fish. Okay. Um, they're not cold water like trout. They're not warm water like largemouth, but they're a cool water fish. And so a lot of your pristine Ozark streams usually are fed by springs or at least have tributaries that are spring-fed right. to keep the temperatures cooler than they normally would be. So they thrive in a certain gradient as well. So if water is um, slower and more stagnant, they're not going to survive as well um, or thrive as well um, because the temperatures go up. Yeah. Um, right. Less food. They do like current, just like a trout. Yeah. Um, I I'll, always said smallmouth do not live in ugly places. Typically, you say that about trout. Well, smallmouth live in trout-style water. They mm -hmm. really do, and you'll see it um, after we finish up here. Um, I'm going to take them fishing so you guys can <laughs> be jealous. S sorry, everyone. You can't <laughs> join us for everything. <laughs> um, you'll see. I mean, it, it has western trout stream written all over it. It has the foam line that you would look for, which is where you'll also find smallmouth. Yeah. It has bouldery pockets, which is great ambush territory. So they'll hide, hide behind the boulder, shoot out into the current to eat whatever's drifting down, just like a trout would, mm -hmm. and then go back. Um, they also love, um, in the evening times, they will move out into the riffles and the shoals to chase minnows. Okay. So that's in the shallows. Yeah. So um, you'll, in the evening time, just before dark, you'll see minnows busting along the, along the bank. That's where they move in the evening times. Basically, they, they hunt in wolf packs. Okay. And uh, I didn't know that. I thought yeah. they were pretty individual yeah. fish. You will find uh, individual chasers. Typically, it's the smaller ones that do that. Okay. Your larger fish will, basically like a pod of orcas um, or, or dolphins, they'll gather up a, a ball of bait fish and they'll take turns 
running into the ball of bait fish. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I have, a, I have a video of it. It's that's pretty, amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. An aerial video of this taking place. It's really, really cool. Um, but th- that's what you're looking for in the evenings is, is the shallow shoals where there are a lot of minnows. They're going to be out chasing minnows. Gotcha. So. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Uh, so does that? So in the evenings, then do you change a little bit? Do you go from the creek collar to a small little um, minnow imitation sometimes in the evenings? So I let them tell me what they want. Yeah. But typically, yes. Okay. I'll go to a minnow, so especially if I'm seeing minnows running everywhere. Yeah, sure. Away from smallmouth, I'm going minnow or I'm going topwater minnow. Um, if I can fish topwater, I am. But I think I mentioned earlier this creek again is so different than most streams. It, usually doesn't allow for a lot of topwater fishing because you can't keep the panfish off long enough to catch a smallmouth on topwater. Yeah. Um, I usually, if I do fish topwater, um, which there's days when it's just on fire, um, I'll use a topwater bait fish imitation. That does keep a lot of the panfish at bay. Okay. It also, it's uh, better for my clients. They can have an active retrieve back to the boat instead of sitting there and watching a boogle bug drift by. Yeah. Um, Boogle bug still reigns supreme um, when you can be on a stream that smallmouth will eat it quicker than a long ear sunfish. Yeah, right. Uh, but I do have to go usually bait fish minnow on the surface Okay. Um, when it comes to top water. So, yeah, I will switch to a top water minnow or a, or a craft for a clouser yeah. in the evenings. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, in, in terms of you mentioned um, – People always say smallmouth don't live in, in ugly places. They live in pretty places, just like trout. And you actually were telling us earlier as we were on our way here, you actually had some clients this morning that you were you were teaching basically how to trout fish um, on smallmouth waters and and just getting them that exposure because they I think they were preparing for a trip or something like that. So it is that it's actually something that you can use waters like this, which are everywhere. You don't have to go to trout water um, to to get that experience. Yeah, so we do definitely have an abundance of smallmouth streams throughout the state. If you look at the state of Arkansas, there's like a diagonal line you could draw uh, basically from the southwest corner up to the northeast corner. Everything above that line is smallmouth streams. There's not a smallmouth on the bottom of that line. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, uh, you have a lot of options when it comes to finding water to fish. If you are not close to trout water, you're close to smallmouth water. I can guarantee you. Um, But with that being said, yeah, I had some clients this morning that are preparing for a trip to Montana. They have never fly fished before, but they were going to try to fly fish out there, and they needed to learn just the basics. They needed a chance at being independent um, next week as as much as they could be. Obviously, all of us will need more practice than just one morning of fishing. Sure. Um, anyway, so naturally I brought them to Crooked Creek to learn how to trout fish. Yeah. So, um. I'm sure they were surprised a little bit. Like, yeah. Like, what are you doing? Man? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what we did was we came down here, found a great stretch I know that looks just like a western trout stream. It has everything you would need to know about a western trout stream in this little stretch. And, uh. We, we dissected the water. I talked them through the different types of water, the foam line, how in, important the foam line is, color change in the, in the stream bed from dark to light, green to brown. Um, talked about that sort of thing, structure, shade, all that sort of thing that would, would matter to a fisherman. And then uh, we were able to practice casting, dead drifting, um, flies under an indicator. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, we actually caught tons of smallmouth this morning. Yeah. uh, Indicator fishing, nymphing with stonefly nymphs. Yeah, that's awesome. Which, speaking of, we have a lot of stoneflies in this creek. In Kirkwood, you do? Yeah, we have a big golden stonefly hatch here. A little tangent here, but we have big stoneflies um, that hatch in the the late summer on this creek. In the early spring, we have a sulfur mayfly hatch. Mm-hmm on the creek before oh, it happens cool. on the white. Yeah. And it's if you're there at the right time when it's happening in the afternoons on the spinner fall when the mayflies are have transformed and they're coming back to the water, uh, the fishing for smallmouth with mayfly patterns is something awesome. Wow, that's it, cool. It's really cool. Um, they'll fly four feet out of the water to eat these mayflies. No way. And the carp are sipping them on the surface. The suckers are coming up. It's the craziest thing ever. Um, but I've been lucky enough to have that happen a handful of times. Um, it's pretty sparse. It doesn't happen for very long. Just in the spring, 
um, just for a few days and not all day. Yeah. It's, they'll come off a little bit in the mornings and the spinner fall is pretty big yeah. in the afternoons. Um, but a, a small yellow um, sneaky peat popper yeah. just dead drifted is a great little... It's enough of a mayfly imitation for yeah. a small mouth. Yeah. And it works great if you've got some on hand and it's happening. It's it's fun. It's fun. So always keep a small little yellow sneaky peat in yeah. the box just in case. I've always got at least one. Yeah. There I've you always go. got at least one. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, I mean small mouth, they live in trout ish waters. Mm. You know, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's it reminds me as you were talking something you said a little bit ago, um, talking about how you were talking about how they're up against the boulders and in the structure and stuff like that. Gosh, it was probably several weeks ago we interviewed um, uh, John Stein from Game and Fish. He's a regional fisheries biologist over in, I think, northwest Arkansas. And he was talking about days that they'll go out and actually electrofish in, I think he was talking about the Illinois, may have been Crooked Creek, I'm not sure. But he was saying they would go out one day with an electrofishing boat. They'd shock the water, and then they'd count. They'd do their tagging, they'd do their research. Then they'd come back the next day, and they would actually catch more fish angling the next day than they did electro fishing because his his estimate or you know his guess was because they are tucked up underneath structure you may shock them but they're not coming out because they're under a log or they're under the bank or they're up against that big structure and i think it goes to what you were talking about how they're an ambush fish you really kind of got to pull them out away from that structure to where they're a little bit more vulnerable yeah yeah they're definitely an ambush predator they will hide out and wait um, for food to come their way. Now, there are times of the day, like late evening when they're out chasing um, or prowling the the sand bottoms for crawfish and things like that. But they're definitely, um, especially high sun, high noon, they're they're hiding out under the shade, under rocks. Um, up underneath a, a little log along the bank, you'll see, you know, 20 smallmouth tucked away that are not coming out. Yes, yeah. you go up there and kick your foot under there, you know. Um but, yeah, they like to hide out for sure. They know how to stay safe. They know how to survive, um, and they will continue to, to survive. Um, with that being said, the reason why they're so good at hiding out, they can almost chameleon mm. to the bottom, to the stream bed. So um, I'm, I know you've noticed the striping uh, marks, the war paint yeah. on a smallmouth. Um, a lot of times... You know, you'll catch a smallmouth and he won't have any, and by the time he's in your hand, he's got he's all striped up, and that's due to stress. But they can change with the stream bed. A lot of times, when he's calmed back down and you lower him into the water, he'll change and just melt right back into the stream bed wow. color. It, we have a lot of great pictures on our presentation that me and Dwayne do of that happening, like a smallmouth transitioning into the just melting and disappearing into the stream bed. It's really cool. That's awesome. That's really cool. Well, you're making me. You're making when it when it in the interview and get out on the water here pretty soon. Uh, I will ask you. I'll ask you w- one more thing, kind of to leave our listeners with. Uh, for if you're if you're wanting to get outside, you mentioned kind of the pandemic put a lot more people outside and wanting you know needing something to do to get out of the house. And they're fishing the streams more. They're fishing Crooked Creek more. They're fishing everywhere more and getting outside. What would you say to people who who want to get outside and enjoy the resource that we have in smallmouth? Definitely do it. Uh, you will not regret it. Um, I also will say, do not be discouraged. Um, now, your smaller smallmouth, your eight inchers, your nine inchers, take a five weight, take a four weight, go catch those all day long, and they will be eager to eat all day long. They're the easy ones to catch, and they still fight great. Especially yeah. imagine a, a eight inch smallmouth on a three weight. Ooh, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but keep at it. I mean, you will fall in love with it. It's hard work, especially this time of year when you're walking miles um, to chase smallmouth. But keep at it. Do it. Love it. Enjoy the the native symbol of the Ozarks um, because, you know, we're not guaranteed they're here forever. Um, they're going to continue to fight to be here forever. But um, unless we take care of them, they won't be here forever. Right. So enjoy it while we can. Um, and... Uh, Love every second of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great place to end. Tad and I are going to go get on some water and and catch some fish. Um, But thanks for listening, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know by leaving a review or a five-star rating. And thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.